All right, listen, between new movies and TV shows, there's a lot going on right now. There's the new season of House of the Dragon. There's Kinds of Kindness, the new Emma Stone movie, and a new Despicable Me. The group chat is here. We have a lot to get into, so let's go. I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. This is Commotion. Okay, look, the, the, the July 4th weekend is usually a big deal for the box office. And this year, the biggest movie at the theater was this one. Gru, I need a word with you. Your family's lives are at stake. What? Maxi Nabal has escaped from prison. I'm coming for my revenge, Gru. <laughs> <laughs> That is a bit of the trailer for Despicable Me 4, and thanks to this run that grew and the minions have been on for this last decade or so, Despicable Me has now become the highest grossing animated franchise of all time. And the studio that made it is now, of course, one to watch. Rad Simon Pillay is here, Terry Hart is here, and for the very first time, Sam Adams is here. They've all seen Despicable Me 4. They have a lot of thoughts about this and more. Guys, welcome to the show. Hello. Hey. Hello. Hey. I'm delighted that you're all here. Listen, Terry, I'm going to start with you. Maybe you want to set up for people who have been under a rock, and they do exist. They're out there. Uh, people who don't know what the Despicable Me franchise is all about. What's the basic premise of this world here? Sure. Um, Gru is a super villain who, in the first movie, adopts three orphaned girls to help him steal the moon. Um, but then he falls in love with the girls and he decides that he's not going to be a super villain anymore. So, um, going on throughout the franchise, this is four that was just released. Uh, he becomes kind of super villain adjacent <laughs> and joins the anti super villain agency, anti villain league. Sorry, the anti villain <laughs> league. Um, he gets a wife. And uh, the girls are sweet and lovely. And then in the fourth one, very important that they have a baby boy. It's very important that it's a boy because Gru's very happy to finally have a boy. We uh-huh. talk about that a lot in the movie. Sure. Um, and he gets roped into kind of some villainous work by his super villain aspiring next door neighbor. But most importantly, the super villain that he put in jail gets ta- get uh, like escapes from jail and he and his family have to go underground and live a, a, a different life. That sure. villain's name is Maxime. And um, the minions, they get maximized. So they're mega minions. They get injected with stuff. So and the minions are like go, his henchmen usually. And yeah. Then, okay. Yeah. They're, if for anybody who hasn't seen it, they yeah. are the, you know, highlighter yellow characters that wear the blue overalls. Yeah. And this is all true. Like everybody thinks, might be thinking that I've had a brain problem it right did, now. Yeah, you were talking. About this like, is the plot of the movie. This is did, the plot of the As you were movie. talking, I was like, I think you might just be inventing the plot as you go. <laughs> um, but you know what? I, I, choose to, I choose to believe you. You're the expert here and I choose to believe you. Uh, Sam, you saw Despicable Me over the weekend. What did you like about it? Um, well, as you can sort of glean from Terry's plot summary, um, these movies are very openly silly. Uh, yeah. I think that's one of their strengths. <laughs> sure. Uh, I mean, half of the characters, the minions who have kind of out, um, maybe even outstripped grew in popularity at this point to the extent yeah. that they kind of get their own discrete half of this movie. Like you could cut out all the Gru stuff and you'd probably still have 40 minutes of movie. Mm. Um, so they're, you know, they're just sort of openly silly um, and there's a real sort of regularity to them. I I wouldn't, I, I've seen at least five of the six movies, possibly all of them. Um, and I, I wouldn't call any of them great, but I think they're kind of just the right level of enjoyable um, to, and obviously to sustain this, you know, kind of incredible popularity over, you know, almost 15 years at this point. Uh, the thing that you just said there is important because you said uh, five of the six movies, and this is Despicable Me 4. The franchise has six movies. as There's two Minion movies and then four Despicable Me movies. Rad, I think this, this the, it's, it's, I think it's correct for Sam to say these movies are sort of outwardly silly. They're trying to engage you in an idea of like, this is Gru. He's a villain, but also he has a redemption arc. Is that actually even present in these movies? Do they even really care about that arc, do you think? 
No, I don't think these movies tried to tell a story since the first one. <laughs> you know, like that re- <laughs> the redemption arc was yeah. that was the premise of of the first movie, as uh, Terry so wonderfully explained, where Gru was a villain who wanted to steal the moon, and then you yeah. know he's redeemed by these young girls, and that was actually part of kind of a trend in terms of narratives back then in animated movies. Because right before Despicable Me, you had Megamind. Right after it, you had Hotel Transylvania. So you had this trend of of anime. Like I mean, the first villain of all, origin the, story. The, the yeah. villain or yeah. yeah. Be- villains becoming heroes yeah. essentially right yeah. making great heroes so so yeah we, we i mean ever since that first movie i think these movies have become kind of sketches they are a collection of different sketches that as sam said are very silly they don't really try to tell you any kind of a story and really even in this movie if there's any kind of plot it's it's uh grew awkwardly trying to fit into to get acclimatized to his dad bond role mm-hmm. uh but really again these are just a collection of silly sketches and it's always been about the minions i would hate to be- hate to for y'all to believe that i brought you here to talk about despicable me for as a serious movie <laughs> that is not the point of this the point of this is to talk about the the size of the juggernaut that this thing is because you know i think if you watch the very first despicable me despicable me movie which was in 2010 i don't think you look at that and go oh this is going to become one of the most profitable animated franchises of all time and it has largely done so on the strengths of the minions terry so like you know it's 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 worth pointing out that like these minion characters were supposed to be the henchmen very much side characters they're the fun parts of watching these movies like i think like these are the parts that like children most Mostly react to the minions themselves are so popular that it is worth pointing out that the minions, the first minions movie, did better than all the other Despicable Me movies in the franchise. So, do you want to talk a little bit, Terry, about like the the, the cultural footprint of these minions, if you will, because it seems like they are way bigger than even the franchise itself. Yeah, and they don't really speak like they're you, you can't discern the words they're speaking, speaking gibberish for the yeah. show. they're speaking gibberish which i mean i know i am not the target audience but yeah. i find it like annoying i find the <laughs> <laughs> i'm like say a word um I, you know the cynic in me and and despicable me four definitely brings out the cynic in me because yeah. it just seems to me like they're really ramping up the merchandising with the mega minions yeah. here um it's an opportunity to roll out a whole other set of stuffies a whole other set of games a whole other set of video games and like it's not Stuart and kevin who were the popular minions there's a whole new set of minions that are getting mega sized here their names yeah. are dave gus jerry mel and tim i'm learning that minions uh, have names which is news to me <laughs> and to be they're all with boy they're all boy names sure they're yeah. all boy names so i mean you know listen i took my favorite seven and a half year old to see this movie and um she hadn't watched the other movies she didn't really understand what was going on but she was really happy with her fruitopia in her minions cup sure so i guess what they're doing is right right they're they're merchandising these movies so that kids are going to ask for these mega minions now that their other minions are out of date well, I also feel, sorry, that like yeah. minions are, they were supposed to be a gag about migrant workers, but they were so adorable that we all forgot to be offended by them. That was literally the, <laughs> the that was literally in the first movie. That's exactly how they were actually portrayed. Uh, yeah. Like they were supposed to be sort of analogous to that. And then we moved so far away from that. But also I think like as this franchise has become more and more successful, Sam, I think it's now worth talking about Illumination. Illumination, the studio that makes these movies, um, who, like, they, uh, since their existence, they have not really made a flop. They're, it's like they're 14 out of 14 in terms of the movies that they make. Um, Super Mario Brothers was the biggest movie that they made. I think it's like $1.3 billion gross. Um, but also, they've made Migration, which is like, a, a, a small animated movie that most people have not heard of, and it still was quite profitable. There's something to me about the success of Illumination Studios, powered by the minis and powered by this, this you know, Despicable Me franchise, that is like, are we in Pixar territory? Are we in Disney territory when it comes to the success that Illumination is having, Sam? I think we are in terms of success. I mean, in a in a way, I think what has made Illumination successful and looking at the franchises they've had, yeah, you know, um, you know the Despicable Me movies, Secret Life of Pets, Sing uh, two yeah. Sing movies, yeah. yeah. And I, as I was saying about the mini movies, I don't think I don't think any of these are great movies. I'm not sure I've seen anyone ever argue that, but I feel like they're really um, kind of occupying the middle as 
Pixar and Disney are kind of keep ramping up their ambitions. Yeah. Um, these sort of are the equivalent of like a, a you know, TV show that you tune into every week. Like, you know, <laughs> you know what you're going to get when you yeah. go to a Despicable Me movie. And it's just just kind of smart enough that like as as the parent, I'm like, you know, they're little nods to like Terminator 2 and the second Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie that I can sort of you know, feel like my brain isn't protectively shutting down while I'm watching this. But they are, you know, they are very much sort of geared towards, um, especially the minions are really geared towards little kids. Yeah. Um, but I see, you know, I went with my my daughter who's uh, 15, almost exactly the same age as the franchise. And she, it was her idea to do this. And she's huh. a teenager. She's, you know, pretty, you know, concerned with doing stuff that's cool and not sort of kid-like, but this franchise still really has a hold yeah. on her. And if you want the names of like all the minions, you know, she was like, where's Bob? And I'm like, who's that? The one with the one? I don't, I don't know the names of anything, but she can tell you. That's, I mean, Rad. To me, that's interesting. The idea that a that a 15 year old, you know, has a closer relationship, you know, with the minions and can identify Bob out of the minions, mm-hmm. as opposed to like identify who like Mickey Mouse might be. So like that's that's the interesting transformation. Do you do you see Illumination as on that path to becoming a Disney, or are we kind of actually already there? I mean, like, they certainly have the infrastructure and the economics of being kind of another another juggernaut corporation that yeah. has then, like, paved its way to children. I mean, you mentioned, like, yeah, Sam's daughter, like, I mean, he, she knows the, 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 the names of Minions. I remember the last Minions movie, there was a whole, like, gentle Minions trend where you have these teenagers <laughs> going to theaters dressed up in suits, like, behaving, you know, like, uh, causing a ruckus to watch the Minions movie. Yeah. And it's because it's so formative for them, right? Like, the first movie is 2010. Yeah. This, is, um, this has been in their lives the way, like, you know, I guess Lion King or whatnot has been in a lot of our lives. And the thing is, like, Again, hmm. back to Sam's point, like Illumination is a studio that does they they, they make such lazy movies, right? Hmm. It's like it's like I have not heard a single compliment of these movies where the the reviewer has not felt sounded browbeaten into submission by, <laughs> by these things. But it's like for kids, it's so simplistic. It works because yeah. they identify these trends, they make it adorable. The minions being like a simple colored yellow makes loud noises. We don't even know what they're saying. Great. It works for kids. And I think that does help them become the juggernaut that they are. I am a 36-year-old man. I've never felt old until you said the gentle minions trend. And now I will go <laughs> retire. Okay. <laughs> My name is Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. This show is called Commotion. Rad, Simon Pillay is here. Terry Hart is here. And Sam Adams are here. Look, uh, it's been a big year for Emma Stone, thanks in no small part to that Oscar win for her role in Poor Things, directed by Yorgos Lanthimos. Emma and Yorgos are back together for a new film. It is called Kinds of Kindness. I am going to play you a bit of the trailer. Can I have a cigarette? Sure. I don't know you smoke, please. I don't. I've never smoked. Should we all go upstairs to the bedroom? Maybe next time. I'll clean up the plates. That is a brief clip from Kinds of Kindness, starring Emma Stone, also Jesse Plemons. Rad, this is the third collaboration between Emma and Yorgos. Uh, I'm going to start with you on this one, because it's, uh, let's say that Yorgos movies are becoming somewhat of an acquired taste. What, why do you think that is? I mean, what can I say? Like, sadism is an acquired taste, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, like, I mean, I mean, the thing, like, look, his movies are weird. His movies are <laughs> often uncompromising. And, and they're always about, like, you know, people exerting control over others in cruel ways, right? And yeah. this goes all the way back to, like, you know, I first, dis- a lot of us first discovered Your Ghost through his uh, Greek movie uh, breakout hit, Dog Tooth, yeah. which was about a family living in isolation, basically, like the kid. The, the adult kids of this family are cut off from the rest of the world. They they develop their own behavior. They develop their own like kind of language, yeah. and we're kind of observing how that how that how they you know lean towards cruelty in a sense. And it's just kind of the study of human behavior. And that's a story that Lanthimos has been telling throughout his career. Like he's yeah. basically been kind of remaking like different versions of that story in in, in all of his work. And it, only lately has it become a little more crowd pleasing and awards friendly <laughs> with movies like The Favorite and yeah. and Poor Things, right? Yeah. Uh, but until now, until Kinds of Kindness, which is a bit of a return to form, but also let me just stretch out the same thing I've been doing for almost two hours and forty five minutes of you know unnecessary cruelty. Uh, unnecessary cruelty is absolutely the name of the game. That is a theme here. Uh, Kinds of Kindness is not one movie; it is three. You know, it's just three small movies. 
I, Sam, I'm not necessarily usually partial to anthology movies. Like, that's not normally what I go to the movies for. But maybe we can talk about this one. Emma Stone and Jesse Plemons each playing three different characters and three different stories. And what's the through line that connects these three stories, would you say? Um, well, one important thing to remember about this movie is that it was originally, until Saner Minds prevailed, it was originally going to be released under the title and um so that's <laughs> roughly the level of connection between the three stories we're talking about um they are all i mean they are all as uh, um you know based around the sort of idea of as we just said like kind of you know manipulation and sort of emotional cruelty yeah. um and you know they're definitely movies that yorgos lanthimos has made along those m- lines that have left me like pretty cold i'm not a big you know killing it with sacred gear fan for example that movie just feels kind of mean to me what really <laughs> yes. redeems this one for me even though it is you know greatly excessive it's three stories each of which is almost an hour long yeah. um it's just really funny like this is you know it's this is so a very funny. mean movie yeah. but it's yeah. funny but it's mean in a really funny uh way and that really redeems it for me yeah it's i uh i was i was the only one laughing in the movie theater that i went to terry and i don't know if that says more about me than it is it does about the people that i attended the movies the screw the screening with but also terry i know so i'm coming to you and you're like you're revving you're ready to go because you hated this movie do you want to talk about why kinds of kindness didn't work for you I can recognize everything everybody is saying here. I yeah. did laugh, you know, a yeah. few times. The performances by Emma and Jesse are fantastic. Yeah. But I hated this movie with the white hot passion of a million suns. <laughs> I do not. All right. Hold I back. Do Don't not, hold back. Yes. Uh-huh. There's no way I want to feel like that in a movie theater. There is no mm. way I'm I'm so sick of Yorgos like <laughs> having his actresses be aggressively naked which we see again here with Margaret Qualley and Emma Stone. Yeah. I'm sick of his male gaze. I'm sick of his, you know, we talk about cruelty. There's it's often so much cruelty towards women. I'm sick of it all. And I think that there was a blip there around poor things because of Emma because and Mark Ruffalo, who's also fantastic, Willem as well, that he gets great performances from actors. Mm -hmm. But when you peel away those performances and you ask yourself, what is this filmmaker really trying to say? And why is he getting primarily his actresses to be as vulnerable as they're having to be on screen that in this world can, that can be used against them so readily and so dangerously I'm over it uh that's a very succinct you know description of being like you know what you goes enough of the thing that you've been doing for some time I I'll tell you two things one I don't think you needed all three movies in this you know I think the last one while Emma Stone has her best performance in the three of them. She has her best performance in that last story, Sam. To me, um, it's the least necessary of the three of them um, and, the mo- and, the, and the more conventional one. The first one, I was like, make this one a two-hour movie and I'm here, man. Like, that's, mm-hmm. I had a great time watching that very first one. Um, but can we just talk a little bit, Sam, about Emma Stone? Because Emma Stone and Yorgos – a very fruitful relationship. They they're going to keep it going for another one that's going to come out next year again. Uh, do, do you want to talk a little bit about because you wrote about Emma Stone being in her freak era, right? Well, what's really interesting for me is this relationship between Emma and Yorgos kind of started after she won her Oscar for La La Land, and at that point she could have, you know, signed on to some superhero franchise or doubled her yeah. quote or whatever. And instead, she was like, "I want to take a meeting with this Greek weirdo." Um, and take a supporting role <laughs> in this movie, The Favorite, um, yeah. where I do the first nude scenes of my entire career, um, where I play this really sort of emotionally like tightened character, and I take basically take away all the sort of you know she's you know this incredible sort of girl next door figure. She's got this really kind of warm um, screen charisma, and with in this Lanthimos movie, she just like threw that all out and is like, okay, yeah. I know that I can do this, and people like this. I'm going to do something totally different. Yeah. This weird sort of like almost avant garde, very non naturalistic style of acting. These stories kind of driven by emotional cruelty and coldness rather than warmth. Yeah. Um, and and you know she's producing these movies in addition to now um, other people's movies like us have the TV glow. Uh, and I, I just think she's taking a really interesting turn with her uh, career, both, you know, very much on screen, but also in terms of just being a, a 
you know, really exercising her power to get movies made, even for other people. Right, right if I can just I'll say, I'll take like, Emma Stone and the Curse over. <laughs> this, uh, all That's the way, true. All the way, though. Equally avant garde yeah. performance, but a slightly different kind of take on this. Uh, Rad, I'm interested in this because there's no one really making movies like Yorgos, and he's also able to marshal quite a bit of star power in order to make these, in order to get these movies done. And to me, like, that's exciting. Like the idea that movies that are just like this weird can be playing next to Despicable Me 4 at your local movie theater. I think that's good. I think that, that, that to me, that sounds like a healthy sort of cinem- cinema culture. Are, where are you on what Yorgos brings to the table, you know, in terms of like the, the, the current movie landscape? I mean, I feel like I'm a little more moderate between these two. I certainly okay. did not hate it with the, 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 the heat of a thousand suns. Yeah. Or whatever, but, <laughs> but um, you know, if if I if I was to take anything away from this movie, which is once again, like I said, he's rehashing the cruelest cruelty that he's explored throughout his movies and rehashing the way there's cult like behavior among people. There's people exert uh, control over others. Yeah. I mean, is he also applying that to himself as a filmmaker who commands, you know, cult like obedience among his cast? You know, like. Like as an auteur, yeah. like is he is there so is there that criticism there? So on, on that terms, I can totally like kind of vibe with this movie, and certainly I laughed and certain the parts of that I'm sure you laughed at. I also don't think it should be two hours and forty five minutes. The other thing I'm really fascinated by, or I the, the, the that I, my takeaway from this is like, okay, like you you remade Dog Tooth as Poor Things, and you made it a fantasy fairy tale crowd pleaser movie, right? Hmm. Uh, and and so. That you and you you were so angry that everyone rewarded your movie and were happy and, and enjoyed your movie that you've decided to overcorrect. You're like, oh, you had a good time. Well, let me drag. <laughs> I. I, I keep seeing reports on, on Twitter of, like, it seems like nobody has been to a screening of this movie at which someone else has not walked out. Um, <laughs> and I do, I, I like that there's a movie in the ecosystem from a, you know, subsidiary of a major movie studio that is, like, actually causing people to flee the theater. Uh, yeah. I feel like that's that's good for film culture in some ways. I think that this is what I'm saying is that, like, there is something about Yorgos and the existence of Yorgos, Terry, that to me feels transgressive, feels like it's kind of pushing the boundary of what we can expect from cinema in a moment where, like, we're kind of like always almost waking up from like a Marvel induced stupor for the last 10 years. And you're suddenly having this guy be like, actually, my movies might be alienating to you. That might be part of the point. Do you want to do you want to pick up on that thought? We got maybe like 30 seconds left. Sure. I mean, I am all about having a variety of movies and having a cinematic ecosystem that offers different thought process and offers different challenges for people who are looking for challenging movies yeah. um, to stretch their thoughts. I just, as a woman, I'm I'm sick of it always being at the expense of other women on screen and the vulnerability that that is so consistent in his movies mm-hmm. d- d- at least within him i'm asking him to do something different because obviously he's brilliant obviously mm-hmm. he's capable obviously he likes to push an envelope but he's been pushing the same envelope for a really <laughs> long time and so is it still that then is if it's the same if he's treading yeah. that same path over and over again for me it's not I uh, I would like to see Yorgos make a romantic comedy next. I think that would be a really nice time. But you know what? Until such time that this arrives, we got to just keep waiting. Okay, Sam and Rad and Terry, I got to leave it there. You guys are the best. Thank you for your time. Thank you for energy. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Of course. Thanks. Sam Adams is a writer and senior editor at Slate. Terry Hart is an entertainment reporter and producer. Rad Salmon Play is a freelance film critic whose work shows up at the Globe Mail, CTV, and right here on Commotion. By the way, you can catch him in this very chair. He's guest hosting Commotion on Friday. Um, I should tell you, I'm really sorry we didn't get to House of the Dragon. Maybe we'll get to talk about it sometime next week. In the meantime, that's it for the show today. My name is Elamine. Hey, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> 